Good morning. Um, Chicken Little. We've heard that phrase before. We probably know the character. Um, If you don't and you aren't aware of it, Chicken Little um, has become a phrase, a title used to describe people who warn others or predict of calamity. The caveat is it's usually reserved for people who are foolish in their efforts to do so. People who are overly worried, unreasonably frantic, right? And it's actually, does anyone know um, Chicken Little's original name? It's actually Henny Penny. Henny Penny is, is where we get Chicken Little from, and Henny Penny is a story from Europe, and it was born out of this idea that there is this little chick and an acorn falls on her head, and so she is sure that the sky is falling, and she rushes to begin telling everyone she wants to tell the king that the sky is indeed falling, and now we have taken that story and we've used it for people who are suspected of paranoia or of inciting mass hysteria. Hmm. See, most of us hate being wrong, right? Everyone in this room hates being wrong. The people watching live right now, you hate being wrong. The people who will watch us in the future, you don't like being wrong either. But there are times when we would much rather be wrong. So the day after the 2016 election, I wrote something. Um, Actually, the night of the election because I didn't sleep. And I was inundated with people giving me messages and texts and emails and calls saying, please say something because everything is horrible right now. Chicken littles. (laughs) So I wrote this piece and it seems self-indulgent and it is, um, but I wanted to share it because it, it is where my head was. And after meeting you shortly after this community, probably where your heads were, the, the writing is called, this is why, or here's why we grieve today. So six years ago, I wrote, I don't think you understand us right now. I think you think this is about politics. I think you believe it's just sour grapes, the crocodile tears of the losing locker room with the scoreboard going against us at the buzzer. I can only tell you that you're wrong. This is not about losing an election. This is not about winning a contest. This is about two very different ways of seeing the world. Hillary Clinton spoke about a diverse America, one where religion or skin color or sexual orientation or place of birth aren't liabilities or deficiencies or moral defects. Her campaign was one of inclusion and connection and interdependency. It was about building bridges and breaking ceilings and about going high. Donald Trump imagined a very selective America, one that is largely white and straight and Christian, and the voting verified this. Donald Trump has never made any assertions otherwise. He ran a campaign of fear, of exclusion, of isolation, and that's the vision of the world for those who voted for him. They have aligned with the wall builder. They have co-signed his body of work, regardless of the reasons they give for their vote. Every horrible thing that this man ever said about women or Muslims or people of color has now been validated by millions of people. Every profanity-laced press conference and every call to bully protesters and every ignorant diatribe has been endorsed. Every piece of anti-LGBTQ legislation Mike Pence has championed has been signed off on. A huge portion of our country has declared these things acceptable and noble and American. This is the disconnect and the source of our grief today. It isn't a political defeat that we're lamenting, it's a defeat for humanity. We're not angry that our candidate lost. We're angry because our candidates losing means the country will be less safe, less kind, and less available to a huge segment of its population, and that's just the truth. Those who have always felt vulnerable are now left more so. Those whose voices have been silenced will be further quieted. Those who have always felt marginalized will be pushed further to the periphery. Those who feared they were seen as inferior now have confirmation in actual percentages of the people who live around them. 
Those things have essentially been campaign promises of Donald Trump. And so many of our fellow citizens have said, this is what they want too. This has never been about politics. This is about, it's not about one candidate over the other. It's not one's idea over the other's. It's not red versus blue. It's not her emails versus his bad language. It's not her, dishon his, it's not her dishonesty versus his indecency. It's about overt racism and hostility toward minorities. It's about religion being weaponized. It's about crassness and vulgarity and disregard of women. It's about a barricaded, militarized bully nation. It's about an unapologetic, open-faced ugliness. It's not only that these things have been ratified by our nation that grieve us, all this fear and hatred and racism and bigotry and intolerance. It's knowing that these things have been amended by our neighbors and our families and our friends and those we work with and worship alongside. That's the most horrific thing of all. We know how close this is. This is not about a difference of political opinion as that's far too small to mourn over. It's about a fundamental difference in how we view the worth of all people, not just those who look or talk or think or vote the way we do. Grief laments what might have been the we were robbed of, the tomorrow we won't get to see, and that is what we walk through today. As a nation, we had an opportunity to affirm the beauty of diversity, to choose ideas over sound bites, to let everyone know they had a place at the table, to be a beacon of goodness and decency that we imagine we are, and we said no. The scriptures say that weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning, and we can't see that dawn coming anytime soon, and this is why we grieve today. So six years later, I, I woke up wanting to give a, another message. And the message was, we told you so, but that's not very dignified. It's not very <laughs> loving. And it's not very hopeful. But many of us in this community, we have been living for the past six years with, this, with these realities being in place, or at least we've seen them on the horizon of history, right? For the past six years, many of us knew that days like this were coming. Many of us knew that a moment with the Supreme Court was something that was probably inevitable. And so what did we do for the past six years? We sounded every alarm, we rang every bell, we shot up a thousand flares to rile people around us from fear of laziness or apathy or false security and awaken them to the slow but certain erosion of the bedrock of liberty around them. And day after day, we gathered here, week after week, Sunday after Sunday, and we crafted every urgent plea to persuade people around us. We appealed to their intellects, and to their hearts, and to their theology, and to their politics, and to their values, and to their humanity. And many of them said, you're exaggerating. You're overreacting. I encountered a, a gentleman who said these very things to me. And I encountered him in a hot tub. <laughs> which is not a place you want to encounter someone with a different political ideology than yourself. And the reason this happened was my wife's fault. <laughs> We were, we were at, a, at a wedding, and there was a, a little like, resort area we were staying, and like, like a condo, and there was a, a pool, but there was a hot tub in the center, and there was never anybody in it. And there was nobody in it when we looked over, and so my wife said, why don't we go and we'll just jump in the hot tub, because it was getting really cold for the, for the time of year. And I, I reluctantly did that, because I normally don't like to be semi-clothed in close proximity to anybody. And by the time we got there, I saw three people already in the hot tub. A, a couple of color and a gentleman with a beer in his hand who was gesture, gesturing wildly. And I looked over and I said, no, let's not go over there. Let's not go over there. But we were already there. They could see us walking toward them. And so it would have been awkward. So we eased into the water and all I could hear was capital, capital, um, nothing, this is not, and so they were, he was lecturing them on why the January 6th event was just a non-story. 
And so I sat and listened for a second and thought, what do I do here? So I decided to be me. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. So what you're telling me is, and I began to give him some actual facts. And he said, hey, dude, this whole capital thing was a nothing burger. Now, I've never used the phrase nothing burger. And when I heard it there, it was even worse than I imagined it would be. <laughs> but I share that because he was treating me like I was ridiculous for telling him what actually was happening. And I bet you understand that. Um, people said it to us, but then we said it to ourselves. We said the center would hold. We said an entire political party would not be consumed by one man. We said our elected officials would not abandon their calling. We said the Christian church would never completely discard its namesake. We said good people would not embrace conspiracy. We said the courts would uphold the law. We said the system wouldn't fail us. We said democracy is bulletproof. We often sat here saying it to one another and not being sure we were believing what we were saying. The sky is not falling, Chicken Little. You need to relax. But now, as we watch the rights of women to have autonomy over their own bodies eroding, it's difficult not to come to a conclusion that, yeah, the sky is falling. When we realize that the highest court in our nation has been polluted by a traitorous serial grifter and his cadre of supporters, when we see the people who hold our laws going against the framers of this nation and the aspiration of its best leaders and the diversity of its people, then yeah, it does seem like the sky is falling. When every guardrail of the law and the free press and the consciousness of good people seem to be failing simultaneously in a perfect storm of circumstances that we now feel we can't outrun or avoid yeah we feel like the sky is definitely falling so what do people of faith morality and conscience do when the heavens around them come crashing down when the worst case scenario plays out in real time, when the arc of the moral universe is bending sharply toward injustice, what do decent human beings do when the sky is falling? We hold up the damn sky. We transform our outrage into action. We channel every bit of our grief and our anger and our fear into a focused and productive response. We waste no time in performative displays of despair. We give up our doom scrolling on social media and our hand wringing and our prophesying of disaster because, yes, it's disastrous. But we log out of our devices and we step out our front doors and into the trenches of our communities and we do the work of saving what we can. We give and we work and we organize and we sweat and we fight and when we feel like we're going to expire we rest and we begin it all again these days as difficult as unthinkable as they are they're not new friends people have been in the worst case scenario at other times in germany and in africa and in the middle east and even in this country we're not standing where billions of others haven't stood watching what seems like the inexorable march of fascism and the unavoidable arrival of autocracy and feeling hopelessness creeping up their bodies like a quickly rising flood. Yeah, we're there, but we're in good company. And in every such time and place, despite the odds and the terrors and the options that seem to be vanishing, the good people have done what good people always do. They have bravely and steadfastly spent themselves on behalf of those who would follow them so that those people whose names and faces they don't know might inherit something a little more beautiful, a little less violent than when they arrived. This is our invitation. This is our calling. 
Bono of U2 wrote, this is no time not to be alive. People who care deeply about the world, about equity, about justice are more necessary and more valuable than ever. Think about it this way. Um, plumbers are never as important as when your pipes have burst. You usually don't think about them. Firefighters are never more important to you than when smoke is pouring from your window. Car repair people are most valuable when you're on the side of the road. And as I found out a few months ago, neurosurgeons are critical when you find out you have a brain tumor. Other than that, you don't give much thought to their existence. Fred Rogers said, you've heard the quote, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You always find people who are helping. We don't look for the helpers. We get to become the people who people see when they're looking for the helpers. What an honor that is. What an honor it is to give someone without hope, hope. That's why as terrible as these times are, individually and collectively, we're made for days like these. This community and our values are the whole reason that we have them here. That's why they're priceless. When people wonder if caring human beings still exist, we get to tell them, yeah, they do. When they ask if there are spiritual communities who aren't looking to take away human rights, we can show them that there are. When vulnerable people wonder if they are alone, we can assure them that they are not. I read from Maya Angelou, she says this as well. You should be angry, but you must not be bitter. Bitterness is like a cancer. It eats upon the host. It doesn't do anything to the object of its displeasure. So use that anger, you write it, you paint it, you dance it, you march it, you vote it, you do everything about it, you talk it, you never stop talking about it. There's no denying that much of what we feared in 2016 has come to pass, and likely it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yay! And yet as bad as it is or becomes here or anywhere else, people who believe that love will have the last loudest word still have the responsibility and the ability to walk into the storm of these days and to press our shoulders together and to steady ourselves and to raise our hands to the heavens and to hold up the sky together. And that's what we're going to do. Peace. Thanks.